I'm David Sandalo, and I am told that we have Governor Jay Inslee backstage. And I am delighted to welcome on stage. Great to see you, Governor. Good to see you. Thank Thank you for coming. Great to see you. About time. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you. Well, Governor, we are honored and thrilled uh, to welcome you here to Columbia University. Um, Governor Jay Inslee doesn't need much of an introduction to anybody who works on energy issues, but let me offer it anyway. He is in his second term as governor of the state of Washington. He announced last month that he is a candidate for president of the United States of America. Um, Before serving as governor, he served in the U.S. Congress and the Washington State Legislature. He he grew up in Seattle. He's an avid cyclist and hiker. He's a grandfather of three. He's the author of Apollo's Fire, Igniting America's Clean Energy Economy, which he released in 2007. And according to his website, he enjoys writing and illustrating books for his grandchildren. (laughs) Governor, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming to Columbia. Um, uh, Let me start, Governor, by noting that you've made clean energy and climate change, your top priority issue throughout your career. Why? Uh, Because I have half a brain. I don't know, maybe. (laughs) That's all it takes is half at this point. Uh, Look, uh, this is, uh, you know, we're the first generation to feel the sting of climate change. We are the last generation that can do something about it. Um, Anyone who's been looking at the science even on a superficial basis would have known that since the early 1990s. And I have known that since the early 1990s. And so since then, I have been dedicated myself to try to inspire people to recognize not only the urgent peril of this moment, but the tremendous economic promise of this moment. And I think both are important. So I've approached this from not only a a view that we need to alert our fellow citizens to the dangers inherent of carbon dioxide, but also to the tremendous economic prospects of building a clean energy economy. And as you mentioned, I, you know, I built a, or I co-authored a book about this in 2007, which suggested that we were going to have enormous uh, growth in our economy associated with clean energy technologies. And verily, it has come to pass. And this has been very gratifying to me. At the same time, we've had an acceleration of the urgency of the moment. I just read yesterday that the the melting of glaciers uh, have actually increased by 18% since our last assessment in 2003, and it's five times faster than 1960. The same rate of the urgency is matched by the same rate of the economic promise, where we have uh, now electric car companies building a little bolt that I'm now driving in uh, Orion, Michigan, where wind turbines are sprouting like, like corn stalks. And Contrary to the president's prediction, uh, cancer rates have not spi- uh, skyrocketed because of wind turbines. We're building batteries like crazy in Las Vegas, and, and carbon, we're spinning carbon fiber that goes into electric cars. It's really interesting. When I, when I co-authored this book in 2007, I wrote about a little company starting to make a little piece of BMWs that went in the trunk. And I thought that was very promising. It was a little piece where you could put the spare tire in the back of a BMW. This was in 2007. Now we're making an entire structure of the the body of the car from carbon fiber. That's just in one decade. So I approached this with a a great uh, deal of optimism because I believe in the can-do spirit of America, and I think we're going to tame this beast eventually. So the Green New Deal's gotten a lot of attention. What What are your thoughts on the Green New Deal? I think it's been very helpful from three directions. Number one, it has got it on the radar screen. I mean, look, in the last three presidential debates, there's been exactly four minutes dedicated to what is an existential threat to civilization. That's pathetic. Uh, The Green New Deal has helped elevate the discussion, so it's been helpful. Number two, it has raised the ambition level of what our ambition should be, Uh, and I think that's been helpful. Number three, it has engaged new communities in this discussion. Look, we know who the first victims of climate change are. They're the frontline communities, the marginalized communities, the communities of color. And this has now embraced a broader segment of the American society to be engaged in this mission statement. So I think it's been very, very helpful. But we have to understand, you know, it's kind of like when Kennedy said we're going to the moon. 
Uh, he didn't say he, he didn't design the retro rockets during his first speech. He set the ambition level, and I think that's what the Green New Deal has done. Now it is up to all of us to work together to put policies behind that, as we are doing in my state today, where I'm pleased to tell you that uh, yesterday my a major committee passed a bill that will guarantee Washingtonians 100% clean electricity, fossil free. And that's a goal and, a, and a now going to be in law that becomes law of the state of Washington. Uh, we're moving forward. A bill passed yesterday that will ban hydrofluorocarbons. We will be the first state to, to ban super pollutants. We're moving a bill forward to have uh, much closer to net zero commercial buildings so we don't waste energy. We are leading, one of the leading countries in the usage of electric cars. Uh, we're, near, we're on target to, to meet my goal of 50,000 electric cars uh, on, the, on the road in the next year or so. And we will be the first state next year to have 50% of all the cars we purchase using the procurement power of our state to be electric cars. We're spinning off countries, uh, companies now from our Clean Energy Development Fund. So I think that what we're doing, we have a template for success in my state for the whole nation, and I can't wait to get going. So the Green New Deal has it's been criticized, even ridiculed, um, for banning auto, um, uh, airplanes, for uh, you know, banning uh, beef and this type of thing. What, what's your response? Are Americans really going to buy an agenda in which we, don't, we can't fly to Hawaii uh, because airplanes are banned and because beef is banned because it's bad for the environment? Well, first I would say that's a bunch of baloney. And uh, that's what I told Megan McCain when I was on The View a couple weeks ago. And she said, you know, you Democrats are going to ban planes and railroads and cars. And I said, well, that's interesting, because right now, literally that morning, I had a shiny blue General Motors all-electric bolt made by the American workers in Orion, Michigan. That is a vision for the destiny of job creation in our, in our country. So no, that's just about, it, it reminds me during the Obamacare debate, remember the death panels? The Republicans said we were going to have death panels if we had Obamacare. Well, I'll tell you what we got in Obamacare. I got 800,000 people have insurance in my state, and we're not going to let Donald Trump take that away from them. Okay, so first off, it's a bunch of bunk. Second, what I would say is those who have in, criticized the ambition level of that proposal you know, during Kennedy's, and I lived with John F. Kennedy, I remember when he said we're going to the moon in 10 years and bring a man back safely. We didn't sit around and say, no, no, I think it'll take 11 and a half, you know, or it'll take 12, so let's not start this project. Look, this is pushing the go button on a new clean energy economy. I welcome this discussion. So there, there's been discussion among um, the climate community. There's some climate hawks who say our goal should be 100% carbon-free energy. And there's others who say, no, 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 the goal should be 100% renewable energy. Do you have a, a view as between those two choices? What, what are your thoughts on that? I, my belief is the urgency of this uh, moment is so profound that the goal needs to be uh, uh, decarbonizing uh, our emissions uh, so that we are not releasing carbon dioxide by the gigatons in the next several decades. And that ought to be the goal. And we ought to be open to technologies that allow us to achieve uh, that end because it is a moment of such great urgency. So my view is we ought to be open to technologies that will allow us to decarbonize our economy and not allow CO2 emissions. That ought to be the goal. And that is, we don't have a lot of time here, right? We've got a few decades. So we need to be moving, and we need to be ambitious uh, across all spectrums. And so what are your thoughts on carbon capture, utilization, and storage as part of that? Uh, if it was, could ever be made cost effective and physically uh, effective, I don't think we should eliminate it, but it, there has been, essentially with maybe one rare exception, there has been no place where it has been shown to be really economically competitive by any stretch of the imagination, except there's one plant, North Dakota, I think, that's used, and there, and there you're just pumping out more gas that just continues the fossil fuel industry. So there's really been no place where it's been shown to be effective. What I would also say is, is that, I'll just tell you about the first conversation I ever had with the second George Bush, it was a few weeks before his inauguration, and I was talking to him, and he was a real flan, a fan of, of coal sequestration technology. And what I pointed out to him is I said, well, Mr. President, it does cost more to sequester CO2, right? You do recognize that, right? You have to compress the CO2, you have to mine a way to put it, 
it's going to cost a lot more money to do that. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I recognize that. And I said, Mr. President, why would anyone do that unless they're required to do that? Meaning, why would anyone make that investment unless you have a cap on CO2 emissions or a price on CO2 emissions? And I swear I saw this little glimmer of a light go off in the back of his mind going, yeah, why would anybody do that? And my point was, you're not going to do that, and you wouldn't even think about doing that unless we have a restraint on carbon emissions through a regulatory system or price on carbon. And uh, that didn't dissuade him. He didn't change his policies because of that two-minute conversation. But we have to recognize we have to have a constraint on carbon emissions to drive investments in these carbon fuel or carbon-free technologies. And I'm all about those restraints in a, in a variety of ways. So speaking of restraints and a price on carbon, you had a referendum in the state of Washington on carbon tax last November. Uh, the referendum went down. Could you just offer your thoughts about that and the, what happened and what are the lessons for those who are advocating for climate action? Well, two lessons there, maybe three. Number one, um, when the oil and gas industry, the most powerful a juggernaut politically in American history puts $32 million and, and, and says things that really aren't accurate about the initiative, it's difficult. And that was the situation. It was unfortunate. Um, I'll give you an example. We have, we've made a decision to close our last coal-fired plant, which is a good decision. And the way we've made that is to give the community a transition plan so that we can help the community through that transition as we close the only remaining coal-fired plant in the state of Washington. The oil and gas industry used $32 million, $32 million to make that look like an evil act because we basically were allowing the plant a few years to close down. They tried to make it look like a sweetheart deal. So number one is when you're up against uh, somebody with deep pockets, it's tough at the ballot box. The number two lesson is that is that the, I have concluded, and I've been working on this for a couple decades now, the most important renewable fuel in this effort is perseverance. And we have to persevere. So we did not let that slow us down one iota. The next morning, we came up with a suite of policies that are now going through my legislature that will achieve roughly the same degree of carbon savings as that initiative would have achieved. And one of the good things about this effort is to realize there's not just one tool in the toolbox. There's multiple tools. There are clean fuel standards. There is an outright regulatory cap on carbon emissions, which I placed on our economy. I was the first governor to do this. It's currently being uh, challenged in the, in the state Supreme Court. There are incentive programs like we have in place to incentivize and help people get elected. More, you know, people in the middle class get access to electric cars. There are building code standards which we can improve. There's R&D which we are doing. I have a $120 million R&D fund which has already spun out some companies that are doing good work including in battery storage technology. There are multiple things that we can do and we just need to embrace all of them and, and we're moving forward in that regard. Let's run through some other technologies. What are, what are your thoughts on nuclear power? My thoughts are is that uh, I don't think we should eliminate the possibility of it becoming a cost-effective technology with a huge if with a capital I. There would have to be four major things happen that do not exist now. Number one, it would have to become cost-effective. And as we know, it is way, way uh, away from being cost-effective relative to wind and solar and other technologies and efficiency. Number two, it would have to have truly passive safety systems that we do not, have not been developed yet. Number three, uh, the waste stream issue would have to be resolved. And number four, you'd have to have public acceptance. So my view is it is appropriate, given the urgency of the moment, to support R&D to see if there is possibility of surmounting any of those things. But they would have to be surmounted before it would become a, a meaningful measure of our portfolio. And, and how about um, the shale revolution? The shale revolution in the United States has you know, turned us into the largest oil and gas producer in the world. It's, uh, it's replaced, shale gas has replaced coal, leading to drop in U.S. CO2 emissions. What, what are your thoughts on, on shale? Well, we, need, we know a couple scientific and one economic fact. The scientific fact is 
we cannot burn all of the oil and gas and coal that we have on the earth today. We know if we burn just the proven reserves, the place we live and treasure will not be recognizable to us. This is a scientific fact. And my view is our policies ought to be driven by science. That means that we have to restrict in meaningful ways the usage of these proven reserves through a variety of measures. That includes clean fuel standards. That includes incentivizing competing clean fuel uh, measures. That includes caps on carbon pollution. That includes not allowing leasing on our public lands of fossil fuels that if they become locked in for the decades to come, will prevent us from actually decarbonizing our economy. So my belief is we have to have a suite of policies that will not allow that technology to uh, doom us to a climate change regime that is, makes this planet unrecognizable. And so uh, that means that uh, we are not going to allow, in my view, that a continued expansion in dramatic ways to lock us in. It does not mean that we're going to turn off the gas pump around the corner here in Washington, D.C. tomorrow. But it does mean that we're not going to make infrastructure decisions that will lock us in for 50 or 60 years that will prevent us from getting to a fossil fuel economy uh, by mid-century. And those are decisions that we have to make. And that's based on science. And to me, the most scientific, scientifically literate people in world history ought to be, uh, have the moxie rather than to allow the climate denier in chief uh, to drag us over the, uh, the cliff. By the way, I do want to make the, uh, a comment that we are having success against this Trump uh, denial of science. Look, uh, when he purported to pull us out of the Paris Agreement, and realize he has not pulled us out of the Paris Agreement, only the next president could do that. We are still in the Paris Agreement. But the next morning, we decided we wanted to make sure the rest of the world knew that there was intelligent life in the United States. So Jerry Brown and Governor Cuomo and I, within 24 hours, stood up what we call the U.S. Climate Alliance. We now have 23 states that are members of the U.S. Climate Alliance. This is a powerful group. It would represent the third largest economy in the world today if it was a separate country. And I'm not suggesting that at the moment. But, <laughs> but we have been successful giving the world confidence that there is going to be hope for advanced scientific and economic thinking in this country. And as a result, no one really has followed, with maybe an exception, maybe of Brazil, of Donald Trump over this cliff. And we are growing, it's interesting, if you do an overlay of these 23 states that are committed to a clean energy economy, Trump would say those are the states whose economy should be tanking at this moment. There should be massive unemployment. There should be for sale signs on all of our companies in Seattle, in San Francisco. But in fact, if you do the overlay, these are the states with the greatest economic rates of growth. Look, my state, according to Donald Trump, should be an economic wasteland right now because we've embraced clean energy. We've got the best uh, family medical leave in the nation. We've got the highest minimum wage tied with one other state. We've adopted the first net neutrality bills. I, I passed the first net neutrality bills in the United States. We have, we have a radical notion that women should get paid for the same as men, so we have the best gender pay equity in the United States. We have a transportation infrastructure bill where we have $70 billion of transportation infrastructure when they can't build a birdhouse in Washington, D.C., and 70% of that is in clean public transportation. According to Trump, we should just be a, a massive depression. Well, guess what? Washington State has the best GDP growth, the best job growth, the best wage growth. It's been named by Business Insider Magazine as the best place to do business. And Oxfam is the best place to work in the United States. That is a template for success in the United States. And I hope we get uh, busy on that in 2020. Um, uh, there's been, uh, we have a number of questions here for you, um, for Governor. Um, uh, somebody asks, uh, what um, energy policy successes has Washington had that could be replicated in other states? And then is there a failure that you've learned from your experience in Washington State that you would point to? Uh, not willfully, not willingly, <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, 
Uh, our successes have been uh, significant. Uh, our renewable portfolio standard we passed by initiative, and I was very active in that, has been a spectacular success. People predicted it would, utility rates would skyrocket. In fact, we've built a $6 billion industry putting thousands of people to work. We now have over 3,000 megawatts of wind turbines in Washington State, and they're continuing to expand. Uh, we've had a great success uh, of our research and development programs, and I think nationally we have to have a huge expansion of our R&D. You know, we spent more money developing one kind of Jeep several years ago than the entire clean energy budget of, of the federal government. That needs to change. So we've spun off a bunch of companies. One I partic particularly like to talk about is we started this little clean energy development fund of about $120 million. It spun off a company in in batteries, and now uh, we have the leading vanadium flow grid integration, grid scale battery company in the Western Hemisphere. And my neighbor's kid went to work for him a year and a half ago. That's been successful. Our clean, our electrification uh, effort has been um, successful in part thanks to Kathy Zoya, who I believe was just here, who uh, just opened another charging station in Bellingham, Washington, and as a result for that, that has been very successful. And she was singing the praises of Washington State on stage, Governor. So yep. that is work. Um, but you mentioned the carbon pricing system that has not been successful, and that's why we're moving forward with a suite of other policies. So we've made progress, but the point I want to make is we're not there yet. We need to make significantly more progress in my state in order to, to meet our goals. Back, back to the oil and gas revolution in the United States. This has had an impact on geopolitics. It affects our relations um, with a number of countries, our ability to do things like um, apply pressure on Iran for some of its behavior and um, in a, uh, a variety on Russia as well. Any thoughts on the geopolitics of the oil and gas revolution? Uh, yes. The things you mentioned will be not forgiven 100 years from now when our forests are burned down Paradise, California is rebuilt and then burned down again. Nebraska is underwater. Miami Beach is now a, a reef formerly known as Miami, Miami Beach. None of those things will, will win the forgiveness of future generations. So there may have been temporary benefits in that regard by more domestic energy production. But when you doom future generations to a, a sort of uninhabitable planet, you won't be forgiven for, for those short-sighted decisions. And I would, and one of the difficulties when you're in a leadership position about this is that when you look at the future, by the way, it's not just two degrees, it's three, four, or five. Uh, the book, The Uninhabitable Earth, I'd recommend it. One of the points the author makes is that we've kind of fooled ourselves by only looking at what's going to happen at two degrees. Because we've all said, well, we're going to stop at two degrees or one and a half. What he says is we've blinded ourselves to the potential of four or five. And if you read this book, it really is a kind of an apop apocalyptic view. And so we have, to, we, have to, we have to marry both a scientifically appropriate way of talking about this with an optimistic view of success. And I'm an optimistic guy. I think this is an optimistic country. I think this is a can-do country. I think this is a place that has rises to challenges because we have the most entrepreneurial culture economically. We have the most <clears throat> adept way to build a skilled base because of our college and apprenticeship program. By the way, we're starting a whole new apprenticeship program in my state because I believe we've got to stop telling our kids that if you don't for get a four-year degree, you're a failure in life. So we're adopting a whole new apprenticeship model. We've had our first computer coding apprenticeship, our first healthcare apprenticeship. So I'm just a believer in the ability of America to reach uh, a goal of a clean energy economy, and we can't let the, the scientific fact blind us to the, to the character value of the nation that we need to now call forth um, from the White House. So I'm optimistic about this. Uh, Governor, another foreign policy question. I think Washington State is the closest state in the, United, in the mainland United States <clears throat> to China. China is the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. What are your thoughts about engaging China and US-China relations on the topic of climate change? Uh, it's a very important relationship. We've understood it because we're the number one trading state probably, and that trade relationship has been very important. Like one out of every four or three jobs in my state is related to trade, so we know how important it is. It's been one of the reasons we're the most rapidly growing country, or state in the country. Uh, the first thing I would say is we want China 
to be vigorous in moving forward to a clean energy economy. And because of that, the dumbest thing we could possibly do to inspire China to move in that direction is for us to say, we're not going to go in that direction. If we want to challenge them and ask them to join us, we have to do things ourselves. And we want China to move forward. So the single uh, most short-sighted approach, if you want China to move forward, is to say you're going to abandon the Paris Agreement. How does that inspire China to move forward? Uh, that's the first thing I would say. Second, there's a lot of things we can do with China. Look, our economies are now growing clean energy on both sides of the Pacific on interrelated supply chains. We can do advanced manufacturing. We are doing advanced manufacturing in this country, both in electric batteries, in solar panels, the largest manufacturer of polysilicates that goes into solar panels in the Western Hemisphere is in Moses Lake, Washington. We're part of that supply chain. We can be an advanced, uh, advanced manufacturing country. I love seeing turbines being built in Iowa. I love Nevada's being, or batteries being built in Nevada. I picked those two states at random, of course. <laughs> but uh, we know we're growing jobs all across the country. Governor, we're down to our last uh, minute or two, and we promised to get you out of here on time. I know you, you got to leave. Um, you've had a remarkable career in public service. We have students in the audience here, mm -hmm. uh, School of International Public Affairs at, at Columbia. Just step back and offer advice for anybody who's interested in a public career, particularly on the issues that animate you. What, what advice would you give them? My advice would be to uh, be very cautious about the decisions you make early in life. Uh, I'll just give you an example of two. I met a girl when I was 15, and now I've been married to her for 46 years. So you have <laughs> there's consequences for early decision making. <laughs> the second consequence is I got involved being interested in energy in, in 1972 when I was a student at the University of Washington. And we did a research project. We studied the energy policies of Seattle, Washington compared to Stockholm, Sweden. And we went to Stockholm for several months. And I went to the first United Nations, or first international conference on the environment, world history, actually. So I was kind of at the birth of this movement. And I've been involved in energy issues you know, ever since that time. And I think my caution would be, if this bug bites you, it, it might be with you for a long time. But you should welcome that. And I'm really glad to report to those of us who are not uh, in Generation X or behind that, this is a generation that gets this. They are motivated big time on this. They understand the science. They want and demand my generation. This is the 50th year of Woodstock. And they are demanding that the Woodstock generation do not leave them a degraded future. And I marched with this generation in New York a few weeks ago where they marched past Trump Towers holding up signs that said there is no planet B. They are demanding action. And the reason is it's affecting their lives. I was at Dartmouth the, a few weeks ago, and a woman told me that she had had two conversations the day before with young women who were asking themselves if it was the right thing to bring children into a degraded world because of climate change. Now, when people start to ask themselves that kind of question, we know we need to act. So I hope anybody Below the age of 50 here makes this a lifetime goal and passion. I hope you're a chemistry major. You stay a chemistry major to develop new sources of photovoltaics and battery storage. If you're a poli-sci major, go run for office as fast as you can. Let's go win the clean energy battle. That is our goal in life, and we ought to be dedicated to it. Thanks for everybody's interest in this. Governor, thank you. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Good to see you again. Yeah, take care. Thank you.